Hi, so my name is Emma Jones. I'm one of the consultants at Moorfields in the glaucoma service. Um, so I'm talking about safe trabeculectomy, um, which often sort of Moorfields says um, it's sort of coined this term safe trabeculectomy um, because Professor Kaur, um, one of our senior um, clinicians in the department, um, developed a technique to make trabeculectomy safer. Um, so he's published his technique in a number of journals, um, one which I published with him. Um, so the Morpheal Safe Surgery Technique is based around um, five principles. And the reason why um, Professor Kaur developed this technique was he's involved in a lot of research into anti-scarring techniques to improve the outcomes of trabeculectomy. Because even though it's a very nice and elegant operation to undertake, unfortunately it still has a very high failure rate because of scarring. So um, he developed um, a technique of using mitomycin C instead of 5 fluorouracil to improve the success. And when he tried to introduce this, he was finding that um, surgeons in sort of lots of other different institutions were having high rates of complications with the mitomycin C. And mainly that was ischemic blebs and also leaking blebs. So his technique wasn't being taken up and patients weren't benefiting from this technique because of, the, because of those problems. Then another thing happened in his, pri in his practice. So Professor Kaur is actually a pediatric gl um, glaucoma specialist as well as adult specialist. And we know children grow up and we change as we get older. But unfortunately, trabeculectomies also change as they get older. And with the mitomycin C, if you have an ischemic bleb in a child, then unfortunately, over their lifetime, it's going to leak and it's going to be at high risk of infection and end up the mitis. And if you have children with an only eye and they have a leaking bleb and they get an infection, then they'll go blind. So, um, so these two things are sort of led to him sort of improving his technique to make it safe. So these, these are the principles. So um, at the top, we've got large treatment area. So when you undertake the trabeculectomy, rather than do an injection of the 5-FU, there's numerous ways of doing it, but you want to use sponges so that you've got a diffuse area of mitomycin C. And also, when we do the dissection, we actually do a fornix-based dissection rather than a limbal-based dissection. So you go in at the limbus and you spread your dissection posteriorly then. Um, and when you've got your Westcott scissors, you go all the way up to the knuckle of the scissors where the little screw is because then you get like a very large area that you've dissected under the conge um, and you put your sponges in. The second one is to ensure that you've got posteriorly directed flow, um, and that's to do with your shape of your flap, which I'll show you a diagram of that later as well. Tight adjustable sutures. So this picture shows just two sutures there, but um, usually at Morfields we use sort of three or four adjustable sutures. In patients who um, are sort of Afro-Caribbean in origin, sometimes people still use just two sutures because it's difficult to get good flow with those patients. But for the majority, because we use um, sort of very wide, long flaps, um, we use sort of three or four. Then there's the positioning of the scleral punch. Um, and you want to make sure that your scleral punch is sort of anterior, to, is sort of overlapping with the edge of your, the hinge of your flap, so that your trabeculectomy is not going to valve, and that you get good pressure control. And then also um, the large scleral flap. So this is to do with the hinging as well. So with your large scleral flap, um, Professor Kaur doesn't cut his all the way down to the limbus because of the risk of leakage, but then you have to make sure that your single sclerostomy punch is a little bit sort of further backwards as well so that it's not going to valve um, because of the edges of the hinge. So these are all the steps that we go through. Um, so they're sort of, it looks a little bit dry in this form, but I um, always find it difficult for um, videos to work when I'm doing, um, doing presentations. But one of the important things of this is when you're starting trabeculectomy, you should just revise and in your head know which steps you're going to go through because it's quite easy to miss a step. Um, and also when you're teaching somebody else, if they take over a step, you need to make sure to go back and think, I have to make sure I, I do this step next and not miss anything out um, to make sure that you've 
got everything in an ordered way. So um, we always put in a traction suture, so that's always. Um, Professor Kaur also puts in an AC maintainer onto all of his patients, but for adult patients, um, unless it's a revision, um, we don't generally do that. Um, then the fornix based conjunctival flap is very important so that you don't get any leakage. The anti-metabolite. Um, washing the anti-metabolite away with saline so that you don't get an ischemic pleb. Fashioning the flap. Pre-placing corneal sutures because um, that helps avoid um, sort of suturing on a soft eye. When you're putting in your pre-placed um, releasables, it helps um, sort of make the procedure safer so um, you don't have a shallow AC. It's very important to do your paracentesis before your sclerostomy as well so that you can t maintain your anterior chamber. The sclerostomy itself, um, iridectomy and flushing this so that you don't get end up with your iridectomy. Having a lovely iridectomy under your sclerostomy, but then flushing through your paracentesis and the iris blocks it anyway. You need to flush it both ways. Tying and then adjusting the AC pressure and flow, which is actually the most important part of the procedure to get a good result long term. Um, and then a tight conjunctival closure to avoid any leakage um, sort of longer term. So these are the instruments that we use at Morphils. Um, so um, different people use different types of instruments um, and we use a cataract surgical pack and also a glaucoma surgical pack. If you want any of these slides so you can see the different instruments that we use and what you'd prefer to use and then of course I'm happy for the, um, to share this with you. And there's one extra tool that I use. So the tools um, on the side here, there's some specific tools to more fills. There's something called a core punch and there's also core, core um, conjunctival clamps and they're very good to avoid sort of tearing the conjunctiva because you don't want to end up with buttonholes in these patients with mitomycin C because that's actually going to put you at risk of leakage and infection as well. So the extra surgical tool that I use is, we call it a catena punch at Morfields, but actually there's three different types of catena punches and the one I use is the Lunstodic and that's because it gives you a nice 300 micrometer punch and then you don't have to go back into the eye multiple times like with the Fakasaka um, micro punch you've got a shallow AC once you've initially gone into the AC and then you have to repeatedly go back into it to enlarge it to a good level um, where you're not going to get um, valving of the, of the um, flap. Then the next thing that I was going to talk about is the flow through the flap. So lots of people have done different shaped flaps over the years and you know they all work for trabeculectomy. They were actually less critical when we used to use 5FU but now the shape is more critical and because of the risk of getting anterior blebs which leak and also because of the risk of getting sort of a ring of steel and a very small high cystic bleb. So the reason we do the flap that you can see down in the bottom right-hand corner, so that is a sort of a five by two flap is usually the size that we use there, is you can see where the fluid is going to be flowing. So the fluid takes the path of least resistance, which is going to be the shortest distance to the back of the flap. With the other shaped flaps, you're getting fluid that's going to the side. So that's where it's quickest for it to get to and easiest. But with your sort of oblong shaped flap, the pathway of least resistance is actually posteriorly and that's where you want to get your flow, which is, makes sense why, why the flap is that shaped. Then testing of the pressure, as I say, this is the most important step. So when you're a junior, you've, this is, you're getting to the end of the operation, You've made your flap, everything's great, and you're suturing up your flap, and you're, you suture up your adjustables. And this is a very common problem that we find with more junior ophthalmologists, that they quickly tighten up their three, four adjustables. Everything's tight, everything looks lovely on the table because they've got a nice deep AC. And then the patient comes back the next day, and their pressure's 40. They can massage it down to, say, 10 on the, the next day, but that patient, if your pressure's 40 the next morning, you're going to be having 
a nightmare over the next couple of weeks. Every single time they come back to the clinic, even if you're taking out releasables, they're just going to keep on going back up to a high pressure because when you massage them on the first day, you don't usually take out a middle releasable. Their pressure will just go back up in a couple of hours and their tenons is going to stick down. So they're not going to develop a good bleb. And then when you see them the next week, you're fighting against it because you've got like a shallow bleb that you're just trying to needle, manipulate, do lots of different things to in clinic, and you just can't get it to work properly, and you'll have to take them back to theatre and revise that trabeculectomy. So actually testing the pressure on the table and making sure that you've got a little bit of flow, or just when you just touch the back of the flap, there's good flow coming, and it's not valving is so important. And if you haven't got that, you should be going back, adjusting your sutures, the, in the pack that we have, we do have a core suture adjuster. You can use that to adjust the sutures post-operatively the next day, but it is still a little bit difficult. You grab hold of the knot of the suture and you wiggle it, um, and you can sort of try and get the releasable sutures to be a little bit looser, but it's much easier to obviously do it on the table because if you wiggle a suture and it undoes, <laughs> then you're at risk of getting hypotony. Um, but you can just hold them by the, by the knot and they'll, they'll just gradually sort of loosen up if you give them a little wiggle either side. Um, so you really need to sort of be auditing your results as well to make sure you know what's happening to you and your specific patient population. As I say, sort of some of my colleagues know they're fine. They've got sort of, they're working in South London. They've got a very high sort of African Caribbean population. They don't need to do this so much. They'll just put in the two releasables, and for that population, it works because they scar up so quickly. They have quite a lot of flow going through on the first day, and they don't get hypotony. But for my population, where I work in St. Anne's, we have a lot of sort of Turkish, Mediterranean patients, and we're sort of needing to adjust it a little bit more and put in um, sort of the more releasables and, you know, get a good flow on the table. And as I say, the IOP, the high, the next day, that is not a good sign for you. Um, you're going to be struggling in clinic. Um, so those are my messages for you. Um, and say so thank you. And I'm not sure if I'm going to do questions now or later.